Mr. Speaker. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm great. Nice Welcome. to meet you. Nice to meet you. you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Appreciate it. It's my office these days. It's not quite as big as my old office, but <laughs> it's certainly big enough. Right. Well, you don't spend as much time in Washington. I'm no, sure. no. I get here about once a month. And right. So here's a picture of the Pope and myself uh, when he came into my office, uh, September 24th, 2015. Momentous day, something I had worked for 20 years to try to accomplish. And... Mr. Speaker, the Pope of the Holy See. honor of presenting to you Pope Francis of the Holy See. I wonder if we could, in a sense, start at the uh, at the end, or certainly at the high point of your uh, career. September 2015, um, Pope Francis becomes the first pope to address a joint session of Congress. You were a big part of helping to make that happen. Um, I tried for 20 years to make it happen. 20 years? 20 years. I wrote yeah. uh, a John Paul letter in, uh, in 1995 and promptly was uh, uh, brought into the Speaker's office. That was the number four leader at the time. Right. And, uh, I realized we never had a Pope address a joint session of Congress. And I walk into the Speaker's office and there are 20 gentlemen in there representing every Protestant faith known to man. And so uh, Dr. Uh, Land was the head of the Southern Baptist Leadership Conference and, and uh, he said, uh, Congressman, uh, are you inviting the Pope here as the uh, head of the Catholic Church or are you inviting the Pope here as the head of state? remembering my training at Xavier, said, uh, Dr. Lane, he'd be coming here as the head of state. Well, congratulations, we're all for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was an important distinction. Yes, it was. Yeah. And then uh, and, uh, Pope John Paul passed away and Pope Benedict was elevated, sent him a letter. Mm -hmm. uh, he came to Washington and he went to the White House. Well, I met him at the White House, but he never came to Capitol Hill. Yeah. So when uh, Francis uh, was elevated, I sent him a letter, and of course I didn't hear anything for about six months. And, uh, Cardinal World, the Archbishop of Washington, uh, told me he was going to the Vatican in February of 2015, trying to convince the Pope to come in 2015. So he gets over there, and the uh, Pope says, no, Cardinal World, I'm going here, I'm going here, I'm going here, I'm going here, and I can't make it to, to the U.S. in 2015. He said, but I got this letter from your parliament. I'm somewhat intrigued by it. <laughs> well. Cardinal World says, well, Holy Father, you know, in the U.S. it's called our Congress, and the guy who wrote this letter is a guy named John Boehner. And I can just imagine Cardinal World laying it on thick. <laughs> so I'm sure he laid it on thick, and so the Pope looked at him and said, okay, I'll come. We get to September 24th, uh, 2015, and I've got every camera in the world in my office. I'm there to greet the Pope, you know, I get a little cheery-eyed. I'm doing everything I can to hold this together and shake the Pope's hand, turn around, and let them take this picture. But it was uh, quite a momentous day. The Pope uh, gave a nice address uh, in English, which he worked very hard at doing. And then we had about 75,000 people on the west front of the Capitol. So I get everybody in position, and they're holding the Pope and myself and Vice President Biden back. And So finally we go out, and everybody's cheering and carrying on. And and I think to myself, well, I wonder what the plan is. I don't know what the plan was. So I leaned over and said, uh, your only father, you might want to say a few things. Oh, yeah. So, oh, no, no, spiritual, santos. And you might want to say, God bless America. And God bless America. Yeah. Well, Worked out great. moment. I mean, I, it was obvious to all of us who were watching that day that you were very moved. Right? Um, why was it so important 
for you that he addressed Congress? Why did you persevere for 20 years in trying to make that happen? I don't know. Uh, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic university. You know, there's, uh, I'm pretty Catholic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Pope's always played a, you know, a big role. So, uh, and uh, what was interesting was especially this Pope, who, who, far different than what uh, what we've seen most uh, during most of my lifetime, and so uh, couldn't have, couldn't have worked out better. So it's time to leave. It's time to leave. And uh, I put the Pope and the security guys on my little elevator. It used to be an air shaft in the Capitol. So I meet him on the first floor, and there's this kind of a departure ceremony. And uh, I look up, it's the Pope and me. There's not another soul anywhere. And the Pope takes his left hand and grabs my left arm and pulls me next to him and starts saying, uh, the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. And he's still holding on to me, gives me this giant bear hug with his right arm and says, Speaker, would you pray for me? Who, me? Well, yes, 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 yes. So, by the time the Pope and I uh, went to the door to, for him to leave, I was a total mess. And, you know, within 24 hours of that, you announced your resignation from Congress. So we had a bunch of guests in town, and uh, we had a big luncheon in the office, and all these guests came, and, and uh, they all left, and my phone kept ringing, members calling, Democrats, Republicans, House, Senate, and I looked up about the middle of the afternoon, and I thought, you know what, I've been here 25 years, and I don't think I've ever seen uh, the, the Hill happier than it was that day. So I was going to leave at the end of the year and I was going to announce it in November. Uh, I got wandered down to my chief of staff's office and I said, you know what? It's not going to get any better than this today. I'll just do this tomorrow. I went home at uh, 10 o'clock and getting ready to go to bed. My wife was in town. She was watching TV. I said, hey, I might make an announcement tomorrow. Announce what? Then I'm out of here. So I said, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll let you know in the morning. So uh, I walk up to Starbucks at 6 o'clock in the morning with my guys back and read, think about this a little while. I walk up to Pete's Diner, uh, where I'd eaten breakfast for 25 years when I was in town. And I was walking down 2nd Street from Pete's Diner, and right past St. Peter's Church is a grotto. And uh, in the grotto is the statue of the Virgin Mary. I glanced over there and I went, yep. Today's the day. Just like that? Just like that. Would you describe that as like a moment of grace? Grace? Comfort? Yeah. I don't know. When the members heard it, it was the first time anybody heard it. Because I ran over and met with my senior staff and had to open the house. And then we had a Republican caucus meeting and walked in and, you know, 10 years ago you elected me as your leader. and. And I started talking and the place started quiet and quieter and quieter and finally by the time I told him I was resigning uh, at the end of October as a speaker and as a member, it looked like I hit everyone I'm upside the head with a two by four. So they were anyway, shocked. Yeah. They were all you know, anyway, nobody expected it. Were they shocked by the news or the timing or both? Uh both. Yeah. Well, yeah, they didn't have any idea. So you had made a decision to resign, but your, your decision about the timing of the announcement was really influenced by the Pope's visit. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was the uh, happiest day, 25 years I served in Congress. When the Pope was addressing Congress, you were sitting next to Joe Biden. Yes. Right? Men from two different political parties, two different political perspectives, but both Catholic, right? Both people of faith. Joe and I could have worked anything out yeah. on any subject. Yeah. You know, he was a moderate Democrat. I, I was a conservative Republican, but I wasn't crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but he and I knew each other, liked each other, and we, could, we, we resolved all kinds of things. Uh, and frankly, there's nothing we couldn't resolve. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what got in the way of resolving the big stuff? Everybody else. <laughs> you know, you have to remember, a leader without followers is simply a man taking a walk. Right. And uh, trying to get people to do difficult things is tough bringing them along. It seems to me that 
that the, that relationship between you and Joe Biden is, is, is one of the things that's great about America, right? I mean, you both uh, come from working class background. Uh, both your faith is very important to you, both very devoted to your family. Um, and yet, in the political realm, you have very serious disagreements, yeah. right? Um, but you can do it without being disagreeable. Right. It doesn't cost anything to be nice. Yeah. Not one cent. If 2020 were a choice between President Trump and Vice President Biden, how would you vote? <laughs> Well, I might. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> There's no reason it's to speculate. It's not obvious to you now. <laughs> There's no reason to speculate on, on hypotheticals. Right. Yeah. Not a fair question either. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I can handle it. Every now and then I have to earn my credit as a journalist. <laughs> I got this. I got it. Um, so the Pope comes and visits the U.S. Congress, an event that you've been working to organize for 20 years and you're alone with him in the Capitol. Um, that's a long way from southwestern Ohio. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so h how did your faith form you as a, as a young man? How, was it, a, how did, was it a part of your family? Went to grade school, went to Mass every morning. Parents were the most patient people God ever put on earth. I got a healthy dose of that patience somehow. Uh, but it was kind of a foundation of uh, how my parents lived and what they taught us. Yeah. And, you know, that place not only is a, uh, where you grew up, not only a place of, of great faith, it's pretty solid, like working class, middle America, right? Just as solid as it can be. Yeah. All blue collar. Yeah. yeah. And do you think that, um, that faith and politics have an opportunity to interact in, in a community like that in a way that maybe they don't in a big city or um, in other parts of the world or the country? Well, you know, people in politics uh, come from every walk of life. Yeah. Uh, as I like to say, it's nothing more than a slice of America. We got some of the smartest people you've ever met in politics. And you've got some of the dumbest. <laughs> you've got some of the nicest people and some of the raunchiest. And, uh, and so some faith plays a big role in, uh, in what they do, others not. Uh, but, uh, but having said that, I'd say 95% of the people I served with on both sides of the aisle, here, state house, good, honest, decent people trying to do what they thought was best uh, for their constituents and the country. And, uh, you know, we had our share of disagreements, uh, but, but we got along a lot better back then than we do what we appear to do today. And one of the things that Pope Francis talked about in his address to Congress is the temptation that we have as human beings to divide the world between good and evil, right? The, this, he called it a kind of simplistic reductionism yes. that leads to polarization, right? You know, that uh, probably our experience as a uh, in, with polarization changed dramatically in the time that you served in Congress? Well, they did, but it has changed far more dramatically since I left. It's been almost four years, and uh, it was polarized then, but not to the extent it is today. So what's gone wrong, do you think? Oh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's media, talk radio, cable TV, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, the internet, people starting organizations overnight, spreading news, news, quote, overnight. And it's all this has tended to push and pull people into one of two camps, uh, leaving fewer and fewer people, you know, in the middle. And, uh, and what's made it even worse is that when I was growing up, we had three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, you had local radio station, a local newspaper, that was it. Uh, now, you've got hundreds of choices, and you get to choose where you get your news. Well, but where do most people go? Places they agree with, reinforcing the divide. And then you've got a few personalities uh, into this stew, and uh, it's like pouring gasoline on a, on a burning house. Yeah, it's not good. And Washington right now feels like a burning house. It is. It's it is. seized it is. by impeachment fever. and. 
um, it al almost the the absolute worst form of polarization. Yes, it's uh, we'll, we'll get through this, but it's uh, it's going to be a while. What will it take? Well, either God's hand or 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 some horrific event where where Americans look up and go, oh oh yes, I might be a liberal, conservative, Democrat, or Republican, but first I'm an American, which they've forgotten. So do you have the sense, um, you know, you described the, the, the folks that you worked with in, in the State House and in Congress, uh, in public life, uh, as by and large good, decent people trying to do the right thing. Do you have a sense that, that they're often trapped in, in their kind of partisan polarization, that their, their choices are limited by that kind of narrow horizon? Well, what tends to happen is that members hear the loudest voices in their district. So what are the loudest voices? Typically, in a Democrat district, it'd be the left of the left. In a Republican district, it'd be the right of the right. And, uh, and it's listening to those, those, those shrill voices uh, that, uh, that rattle members into taking the positions they take. Uh, and so, you know, they want to sing, they want to sing to the choir. You know, and so all of a sudden it's pushing them. And it's gotten so bad that even while members get along, and most people never see this because you're not allowed to see it anymore, uh, if I'm a Democrat and Republican got together and did something good, they'd both be criticized. One from the left, one from the right. And they got to the point where I used to go to see President Obama and I'd have to sneak into the White House because if I walked in well, the press would always see me. You know, they, the right-wing press would go crazy. The left-wing press would go crazy on President Obama. Uh, I'm a big believer that uh, you can disagree without being disagreeable. You know, one of those things I learned growing up in my dad's bar. Yeah. You know, drunks would be sitting there all night. You don't want to agree with a guy, but you don't want to get a fight with him all night. So you just find a way to disagree without being disagreeable. Is there still a... Uh place for that in politics? Of course there is. Yeah. You know, it begins by uh, just toning, toning the rhetoric down. Uh, I, I may have disagreed with uh, Speaker Pelosi or Majority of the Reed or President Obama, uh, but I would talk about the differences in terms of their policies. I would never bring personalities into this. It just makes it harder to ever get to an agreement. And uh, so I've got, still got great relationships with all those people. Even though we probably disagree on a lot of policies, they're decent people, they're trying. Yeah. I just disagree with them. Yeah. Doesn't mean they're bad. Would you go into politics today? No, shoot me, shoot me. I didn't want to do this to begin with. The whole thing was an accident. Really? So what, how, did, was, how did you uh, get drawn in? I was busy running my business. I was in the packaging and plastics business. And, Along the way, I got involved in my neighborhood homeowners association. And one thing led to another, to another, and next thing you know, I'm the Speaker of the House. And 35 years later, it was like, oh, this is not what I was going to do with my life, but I was kind of made to do what I was doing. And I realized that sometimes God has other ideas. Yeah. Did you have that sense that you were being led? Oh, no question. Yeah. No question. I, by the time I became Speaker of the House, I had no doubt that the Lord decided I was going to be the Speaker of the House. Yeah. No doubt. I was convinced of it. Well, I would think if you, for, for some people, they, that sense of being led, that sense that, you know, I think this is what God is asking me to do, might, that they could get confused and the power could go to their head. Oh, right? all right. How did you distinguish between those two? Have well, one, I, it was never going to be about me. I set up the, my first day as Speaker when, uh, Nancy Pelosi handed me the gavel. Uh, I talked about service. I talked about uh, Lent and getting the ashes. And, uh, you know, uh, you are dust and from dust and you will become dust. Something like that. You know the words better than I do. Right. And, uh, uh, I, and I, said, I said it to the members then. This isn't about me and it's not about us. It's about the American people. We're here uh, to represent their hopes, their desires, 
uh, and just don't think it's about you. And I, I, I would work overtime, even before I was speaker, just to be me. I didn't want to be somebody. I just wanted to be me. Now, sometimes my staff thought it was too much like me, <laughs> but, you know, in, in what my, way? Well, my proudest accomplishment is after 25 years in Washington, I'm still the same jackass who walked in here, right? <laughs> right. Just a regular guy who had a big job. Yeah. Is the process that we're going through now in this country, uh, because as we sit here, the, uh, you know, the House is considering the impeachment of the president and uh, we seem to be gripped by this fever. Um, is this even a process that we're capable of going through as a people, or is, is the country so polarized? It's, it's un we're unlikely to come to any kind of, of conclusion that's based in reason. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen anything where there's any consensus yet uh, when it comes to this whole impeachment question. And, uh, uh, okay, I understand most of my Democrat friends do, do not like President Trump. I get that part. Uh, they wanted to impeach him before they knew anything about anything. Uh, and, you know, either there's some impeachable offense or there isn't. Now, impeachment is not a legal process. They try to cloak it in one, but it's not a political, it's a political process. Uh, but it's never really been very successful unless it's been bipartisan. And, uh, and I haven't seen uh, Republicans uh, move to join this effort at all. So uh, as it unfolds, we'll see. Uh, I was uh, uh, in the leadership in 1998 during the Clinton impeachment. Uh, very divisive and, and unfortunate. Right. Was it still the right thing to do? Uh, I thought so. The president perjured himself. He violated the law. And as difficult as it was, and as distasteful as it was, you know, you violate the law, you should pay the consequence. So, uh, but unfortunate for the country that had to go through it. It seems like right now the uh, polarization is such that it's very, almost impossible for a Democrat politically to be able to say, actually, I don't think we should be moving toward impeachment. <laughs> That's correct. And, and almost impossible for a Republican yes. to say, actually, maybe we should. Yes. Oh, no. No. That's the, I talked about it earlier. Uh, we'll, we'll get through this. Well, we're Americans. Right. We always figure it out. Winston Churchill, 1940, uh, before Americans... Uh, uh, got involved in the war, was on the floor of the British Parliament and said, those Americans, they'll make every mistake known to man until they get it right. And they always get it right. You know, uh, Americans, we're the most resilient people got to put on earth. Uh, we make mistakes, uh, but we always seem to figure it out. And at some point, at some point, the American people will say, all right, I've had enough of this noise. I've had enough of Washington being Washington. I'm going to vote for somebody else. And the voters will take care of this. I have total faith in our process. It works. So you have, um, are, you're still optimistic? Always. Yeah. I was born with a glass half full. Yeah. If I hadn't been, I surely would never have made it this far. Right. Right. Um, did you pray a lot as speaker? Every day. Yeah. All day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the things that, uh, that uh, I was kind of sorry about was that I, I didn't understand uh, the need uh, to have this personal relationship with our Lord earlier on. But somewhere along the way, over the last 30 years, uh, 35 years, I don't know, somewhere, probably 35 years. I, I, I began to understand the importance of this personal relationship where, you know, the Lord is my king and my comrade, my colleague, my companion. And, uh, and so uh, every morning I, I read a couple of devotionals and then we have a conversation that goes on all day, every day. It's been pretty interesting, this journey. Who are the people that you ad admired, that you looked up to, either you know, people of faith or people in public life, whose example you may have tried to emulate? 
Well, I, I didn't try to emulate anybody, uh, but I learned a lot from a lot of different people. <laughs> Jerry Faust, my high school football coach. Yeah, went on to Notre Dame, right? We said uh, Hail Marys before practice, during practice, after practice. And my God, the day of a game, we went to Mass, we went to Benediction, we prayed before the game, we prayed on the bus. <laughs> Well, I could say Hail Mary every day the rest of my life, and I'll never say half the Hail Marys I did <laughs> in high school. But uh, Lou Holtz. Yeah. We became friends over the last 20 years. <laughs> what a great guy. Also learned from a, Notre Dame. Right? Also learned a lot from him. So uh, Ted Kennedy. <laughs> Ted Kennedy and I, they used to call us the political bookends <laughs> <laughs> for about five years. Uh, I, I was the chairman of the House Education and Workforce Committee, and he was the head of a similar committee on the Senate side. And, uh, <laughs> and we did all these things together, all this legislation together. Now, it would never sound like it because he'd go out and make all this noise, but uh, he was a serious legislator and wanted to get things done. And we always got things done. <laughs> but so I learned a lot of political lessons from Teddy. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Was he a friend? Oh, yeah. yeah. Dear friend. Yeah, we... <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it was I pleasure. appreciate your time. Pleasure. Hey, I'm Zach Davis from America Media. Did you like that last video? I thought you might have since you watched to the end. You should hit the subscribe button to your right to get more great content from America Media. That'll make sure you don't miss a thing. So hit subscribe. I'll see you there.